Okay. Okay. Um, Sai, if you could share the screen, that would be great. Oh. Okay, um, Sai, if you could share the screen, that would be great. Oh. Okay, is it visible? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Sai. So um, I welcome all of you for this edition of the NSF Wednesday Colloquium. And it's a pleasure to have Professor Sai Krishnan Karayat joining us uh, from his office, hopefully in Indian Institute of Science, uh, Education and Research in, uh, in Pune, which is which we fondly call as ICER Pune. Um, so before I introduce formally Professor Karaya, I would like to sort of give a few words uh, for the Wednesday Colloquium um, and uh, just for Sai as well as other audience who are listening to us for the first time. Uh, so the Wednesday Colloquium is pretty historic in TIFR simply because it is the oldest, um, you know, uh, sort of science uh, forum where we have discussions with leading scientists uh, that used to visit TIFR uh, in all of, you know, practicality when it used to be in a proper sense, uh, people used to visit um, and the entire science faculty, students, postdocs would listen to an expert uh, talk about uh, you know, uh, talk about fields from as as diverse as astronomy to as small as about an atom or 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 living cells um, in your body. So uh, since it has it has attracted such a diverse set of speakers, um, it's 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 been a pleasure to run this event for entirety of the time for TIFR members um, all the way from Homi Bhabha who actually started this. So uh, it's, a, it's a tradition that every Wednesday at 4 p.m., uh, some of us, you know, the National Sciences faculty members from physics, chemistry, and biology gather and listen to the exposition of, you know, experts like one we have today, uh, Professor Sai Krishnan Karaya. So um, just to give a brief uh, introduction, uh, Professor Karaya actually, of course, comes from now from the Department of Biology of ISA Pune. But uh, his actual education, he started uh, out as a physicist, actually. Uh, he is a bachelor's, uh, bachelor's degree holder in physics from University of Kerala, um, which he finished in 1996, after which he moved on to Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, um, to do his both master's and PhD. Um, and one of the in in PhD uh, program. Um, and it is here where he sort of um, um, sort of got into the um, uh, got into the biophysics domain and uh, which and especially structural biology, uh, which he has continued ever since. Um, he moved uh, to uh, for his postdoctoral uh, training at, at London Research Institute in Clare Hall Laboratories, and he after finishing four years of postdoc there in, um, in cancer research, he came back uh, to India and one of the very early faculty members in ISA Pune. Uh, he joined in 2010 and uh, he has been there since. He is now, uh, he joined as an assistant professor and then he became an associate professor and now he's a full professor um, from last year uh, in, in, Institute of, uh, in Indian Institute of Science Education and Research in Pune. Um, uh, Sai, for his uh, fantastic contributions in structural biology, uh, has won numerous awards, um, the latest being the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, which he won in 2019. Um, apart from that, he has been a Wellcome Trust GBT Intermediate Fellow uh, and also been an EMBO Long-Term Fellow. Uh, fellow. Um, Sai, without further ado, I would uh, like you to, uh, you know, give us uh, your colloquium on mechanisms of motor-driven macromolecular machines, insights from nucleotide-dependent restriction enzymes. Sorry. Thanks, Jyotiman. Thanks very much for the kind words and, of course, for inviting me to deliver this colloquium. Uh, as you mentioned, it would have been great to be at TFR and uh, not only meet all of you and uh, 
share my research work, but also to look at the seafront, which I always enjoy whenever I'm there. So um, uh, going on to my research topic of the, of the talk that I'm going to give today, it's on uh, motor-driven macromolecular machines. And I'll be focusing on the work that we've been doing in my laboratory on restriction enzymes that require nucleotides. Uh, uh, often a uh, living cell is considered to be a collection of macromolecular machines. And here, what we call a macromolecular machine is a protein or a biomolecule, which resemble a machine. And like a machine, they have functional domains. They have different uh, parts which function together in concert. And some of these uh, machines actually use chemical energy to carry out their function. And uh, if you look at uh, the cell, in particular nucleic acid transaction that happen in the cell, there are many macromolecular machines that work on the DNA slash RNA, including DNA polymerases, RNA polymerases, the ribosome, and so on. Uh, this talk is going to be on uh, restriction modification system, which is a bacterial defense system which acts against invading foreign DNA. So if you imagine this to be the bacterial cell and you can see some things sticking to the cell, these are the viruses, the bacteriophages that attack and infect the bacterial cells. Now you can see that the phages are injecting DNA into the bacterial cell. And uh, if you let this DNA to be there, it could be RNA also. Uh, if you let it to be there for some time, they will replicate. They will make many more copies of these phages, which will burst open the cell and kill the bacterial cell. To prevent, their, uh, to prevent this infection, uh, the bacterial cell has many defense mechanisms, including the recently uh, discovered CRISPR-Cas system, which was discovered uh, more than a decade back now, but was uh, has become a technological revolution in the field of genetic engineering and genome engineering, and which uh, uh, the discovery and its use for biotechnology was awarded the Nobel Prize last year. Uh, but uh, what is interesting is adaptive CRISPR-Cas systems are a very small class of uh, bacterial defense in the bacterial cell. The only about 40% of uh, or so bacteria, bacteria that have CRISPR-Cas system. The most common of them are the restriction modification systems. Almost 75% of all bacteria have uh, this uh, restriction system, which is often dubbed as the innate immunity of bacteria. And uh, what this uh, restriction modification system does is it would cut any foreign DNA that enters the cell and it is able to do this because of a component called the restriction component, which is an endonuclease that cuts the DNA at a particular target site. Uh, there is another component, which is the modification component, which protects uh, the host genome by st specifically methylating the target site and thus preventing the restriction endonuclease from cutting this target site in the genome. Thus, you have a system which is able to recognize foreign DNA from self-DNA and cuts or degrades any foreign DNA that enters the cell, thus protecting it from uh, uh, bacteriophage infection or the viral infection. Uh, there are other implications to having restriction modification systems in the bacterial cell. Uh, one such uh, system is SOUS1, for example, which is a potent barrier to antibiotic resistance. And uh, SOUS1 is an ATP-dependent, which is a nucleotide-dependent restriction enzyme, and it prevents transformation of Staphylococcus aureus. And it has been noticed that you can convert a benign Staphylococcus aureus into a pathogenic MRSA resistant, uh, vancomycin resistant uh, strain of SOUS1 by just, or Staphylococcus aureus, by just deleting this one enzyme. That's very interesting because there are many other restriction enzymes in Staphylococcus aureus. There are other bacterial defense system in Staphylococcus aureus, you inactivate them, nothing happens. Uh, the enzyme can still acquire vancomycin resistant genes and uh, they would become antibiotic resistant. But uh, just inactivating this one enzyme uh, makes this 
uh, Staphylococcus aureus strain resistant to vancomycin, thus becoming a health hazard. Uh, now, uh, my laboratory has been looking at understanding how this restriction modification system that require nucleotide, like ATP in the case of soy and work. And uh, to begin with, uh, restriction enzymes have been well studied uh, in comparison to many other enzymes uh, historically because they were among the first uh, proteins to be biochemically studied extensively. Uh, they were uh, one of the first bacterial defense systems to be discovered way back in the 1960s, which resulted in um, uh, three Nobel Prizes. Uh, one of the Nobel Prizes was for the discovery of the nucleotide dependent uh, restriction modification system, which went to Werner Arbor, uh, while the other systems, uh, other two Nobel Prizes went to uh, studies on uh, nucleotide independent restriction modification systems that then went on to uh, propel uh, uh, genetic revolution through uh, DNA recombinant technology. Now, as I mentioned, uh, this two, uh, the restriction enzymes can be broadly divided into two categories, or at least that's the way we see in our laboratory, the nucleotide independent enzyme and the nucleotide dependent enzymes. Now, what do these enzymes do? Uh, you may, many of you would know that a restriction enzyme cuts DNA. For example, a type two restriction enzyme, when provided with a DNA substrate of this kind, this is a double strand DNA with a target specific target sequence. It would uh, bind to the enzyme and cut the DNA at the at, at the target site or close to the target site. Now, this reaction for this reaction to happen, you don't have to provide anything other than just a metal ion, which often is magnesium. You don't require any nucleotide. Uh, the enzymes that we study in our laboratory are the nucleotide dependent enzymes. But uh, before I go into uh, telling how uh, nucleotide dependent enzymes cut the DNA, I would like to tell you what happens with the type two restriction enzymes, how they cut DNA. And we know a lot about it through biochemical and structural studies. And here is a crystal structure of a type two restriction enzyme, which is commonly used in the laboratory, ECOR1, which is bound to its DNA substrate. Now you can see that uh, there are two copies of the enzyme. Each of them are carrying out one reaction, which is breaking the phosphodiester bond. Now a double strand DNA will have two strands. Consequently, uh, the enzyme has to cut two phosphodiester bonds. One of, subunit here is cutting one of the phosphodiester bond the other is cutting the other phosphodiester bond. Now, this could be a stable uh, dimeric protein like EcoR1, or this could be a transient complex which can come together on the DNA to carry out the, re the reaction, or the, this could be a reaction which is carried out by a single domain where the phosphodiester bonds are cut, being cut sequentially by the same catalytic center. So this is how type two restriction enzymes work. Now I move to the focus of this talk, which are the nucleotide dependent restriction enzymes. And the substrate that they require for cleavage is quite different from the previous example. Here you can see that for DNA cutting to happen, you require a double strand DNA with two target sites. And for most, many of these proteins, the target sites are asymmetric and consequently they have, they have an orientation with respect to the double strand DNA. And the cleavage will happen only when these asymmetric sites are oriented head to head. What is interesting is that the spacing between the two target sites could be as few as few nucleotides, say five nucleotides, to a few thousand base pair separation. Now, um, this is interesting because what we are talking about is communication between two uh, spatially separated uh, uh, regions or on the DNA between two enzymes, possibly two enzymes to carry out cleavage reaction. So how they carry out reaction is if you provide the enzyme uh, and the enzyme would go and bind to the target site. We know this from experiments that we carry out in the lab that they bind specifically and tightly to the target sequence. Now, if you provide s methionine, the enzyme will methylate the target site and as a consequence, the affinity of the enzyme for the target site is diminished and the enzyme falls off. It doesn't do anything further. And this is the state of a methylated DNA. The enzyme does not bind to methylated DNA. 
However, the same enzyme, when bound to a non-methylated target site, in the presence of ATP as the cofactor, would give you DNA cleavage. The DNA cleavage could be some. RM enzymes, or it can be close to one of the two target sites, either here or here. And these are the type 3 RM enzymes which do this kind of reaction. In both these cases, uh, ATP is a requirement for DNA cleavage. S adenosyl methionine or SAM is required for methylation, and methylation prevents DNA cleavage. But all these reactions are being carried out by the same enzyme which is uh, having different functional domains stitched together in the same protein, either as separate subunits or as domains. And that's why we call this as macromolecular machines, which are carrying out uh, different enzymatic reactions to carry out one specific task or a specific task in the cell. Now, uh, do we have structural information on these enzymes to understand the mechanism of how this uh, work? Well, uh, there have been a lot of efforts to decipher the structure of nucleotide-dependent RM enzymes, and the structural information were all, all limited to either individual subunits or domains of the protein molecule. The structure of the entire protein uh, was missing. So was, of course, the uh, structure of the protein enzyme bound to its substrate. Uh, when I started my independent group at ICER Pune, as Jyotish Man said in 2010, I decided to uh, address this question of determining the structure of the nucleotide dependent RM enzyme in whole, and if possible, also with substrate to understand how these enzymes function. That was the whole idea at that state. And uh, the motivation was can we gain insights into how? complex protein molecules which resemble machines can be deciphered, deciphered by studying these enzymes and their structures. So uh, to, uh, towards this, the, one of the model systems that we chose was a type 1 SPRM enzyme. It, we started with LALG1 and then proceeded to another enzyme, LABI3. We work on both these enzymes. And you can see that this protein is a huge protein. It's a 180 kilo Dalton protein, a single polypeptide chain, which has different functional domains. It has a nucleus domain, a motor domain, which resembles a helicase. For those who, are in, uh, who know enzymes, this a motor domain resembles a helicase. And then there is a methyl transferase domain, and the target recognition domain. And uh, in, at about uh, in, uh, 2012, we first got uh, crystals of this uh, protein complex, a protein in complex with the DNA. And uh, after a long effort of four years, we determined the structure of this protein bound to its DNA. And uh, the enzyme, binds to the target site, which is shown here. And you can see that it is an asymmetric target site. And this A that I have highlighted here is an, the adenine, which gets methylated. So uh, the adenine in here is the base that gets methylated specifically by LABI3. And uh, it also can cleave DNA if you provide two target sites, which are non-methylated, and the cleavage happens somewhere in here, in the center. Uh, so it's not absolute center, it is close to the center, and you would see as I go on with my talk why it is going to be close to the center. We determined the structure of this protein molecule, as I said, uh, to a resolution of 2.7 angstrom, and this is the structure of the enzyme bound to the DNA substrate. Here is a piece of DNA which has the respective, which has the target site for LABI3, and this is the target site once again and that target site is over here. Those who have sharp eyes would see that there is a base here, a DNA base, which is the adenine, which is flipped out into the active site pocket of the methyl transferase. This adenine is nothing but the adenine colored red here. It is the base that is going to get methylated. And uh, what we have captured here is a snapshot of the enzyme trying to methylate the base adenine. And uh, uh, in this crystal, I have not provided SAM, uh, acetinosyl methionine. If I had provided acetinosyl methionine, I could have captured possibly the reaction 
uh, or the product state where the adenine is methylated. Uh, uh, what we also see is that the DNA is engaged with the other parts of the protein molecule, which contains the nucleus domain at the end terminus. The motor domain is here, and uh, you have a coupler. Uh, it's a helical bundle which connects the motor domain to the methyl transferase domain. And the methyl transferase domain with the target recognition domain together read the target sequence in a base specific manner. I'll not go into the details of the specificity, how it is achieved, but uh, the two domains here, the orange and the cyan colored domains, together read the target sequence. And the DNA interacts with the motor domain. And uh, what you see is that downstream of the motor domain is the nucleus. So if I had the DNA long enough, it would have got engaged with the nucleus. But we also notice that the nucleus is in an orientation which makes it in an inactive conformation, which is because the active site of the nucleus is pointing away from the path of the DNA, which means that this nucleus is not yet ready for cleaving the DNA. However, the motor here, which is, a, the, as, I, as I mentioned, is a helicase-like motor, is engaged with the DNA. And if I had provided ATP, it would have started hydrolyzing ATP. So I can yeah. ask a question? Yes, Ulas. That is Ulas area. So uh, I'm just uh, interested to know, I mean, so you have this two potentially conflicting activities. One is the target recognition domain, which will aim to stall the movement of the protein on the DNA because it has now encountered a, a, you know some sequence specificity. But you also have this ATPS domain, which is propelling your motor activity. Yes. So um, how much of intra protein allosteric control of one domain by the other is involved? I mean, is that a fair question to ask? Because I would expect both of these to be in communication vis-a-vis -vis domain, uh, DNA. I mean, domain is uh, actually DNA is probably acting as the allosteric regulator in some yes. sense. Yes. So uh, uh, this uh, snapshot that we have got of the structure is actually raising that question, which is absolutely right. Uh, the question being of two uh, uh, conflicting activities in a, in a state where it is ready to go. And one is trying to methylate the DNA, which will protect the, the, the DNA from getting cleaved. And the other is the motor activity getting all turned on and which will result in the nucleus activity being turned on. And uh, so uh, the reason that is going to be allosteric uh, mechanism involved in it. We are trying hard to capture that where we have the ATP bound state where we believe the conformational change would occur and there would be some allosteric mechanism, possibly through the coupler domain. Yeah. And that would uh, uh, regulate the methyl transfers. But uh, what we know from biochemistry, if uh, this is based on the work that we, uh, biochemical experiments carried out in the laboratory, the kinetics of the ATPase is much uh, higher than methylation activity. So the enzyme prefers to hydrolyze ATP and run along the DNA, which I will come to later why we think it will run along the DNA, but it prefers to hydrolyze ATP than methylate DNA. When I take the enzyme in a test tube with both SAM and ATP together, and both the cofactors are provided, which is what is going to happen in the cell. So uh, I, maybe oh. we'll wait, but I just want to ask one oh. quick follow-up question is that suppose if you want, if you now create a completely a chimeric protein, which has an ATPase activity which is either more sluggish or more active. How will that impact your target recognition time sequence? Right. So uh, target recognition per se, I don't think will be affected. But uh, the consequence of encountering a foreign DNA and what would happen to it, would it get methylated and get converted as self-DNA? Or will it get cleaved would surely depend on the kinetics of uh, ATPase activity. If I tweak that, possibly I might uh, get the enzyme to methylate a non-methylated DNA before it would cleave the DNA. So, That's but you've not done any chimeric experiments where you have now changed the ATPase uh, domain. Uh, so, uh, uh, you have said that uh, there are some mutants. The way we do it is by mutagenizing the individual domains. So uh, after a long search, often if you mutate the active site or some of the, yeah, so, we'll lose the, complete the activity is completely lost. 
but uh, we did come with a mutant which slows down the atps activity i'm not going to talk about it it's it's published actually we published yeah i know it. no but i'm saying that because it's a mutant um one could argue that you know it will change the entire uh, folding uh, properties and whatever right. but but if you so were to an active enzyme yeah if you bring in a chimeric molecule hmm. okay where everything is active but that atps turnover activity is changed we haven't done that yeah so that's okay yeah yeah so uh, the uh, question then is uh, i have a question should yes sir. yeah so um, i understand that, that the energy is coming from the atps but the coupler and the coupling to the methyl transferase is um, tenuous and you were saying that it goes through can go through multiple cycles of atps activity without actually putting the methyl on so is the energy transfer some you know some of those cycles will of course would would methylate the dna the energy transfer pathway is it understood i mean you are it seems to be two different domains mm -hmm. and uh, of course uh, you know there is a coupler here but uh, do you know the pathway there is only one covalent uh, bond that I, i can see a chain going from the coupler to the atps uh, so it uh, is very interesting the structure yes, it's, it. it's an absolutely fascinating question because that's that's something that we really started off asking as the primary question how do these domains communicate among with among themselves and uh, we do believe that the couplers could play a role in that we uh, one way would be to uh, identify a network of residues uh, through mutagenesis again uh, to begin with there are uh, methods like evolutionary coupled methods where you can actually identify Uh, networks of residues through protein which are highly conserved uh, which could indicate a network of residues that could be used for communication but then there is also something else that we discovered from determining the structure it's the coupling made by the dna with the two different domains okay uh, i didn't mention it in the talk but uh, unless you have the enzyme recognizing the target sequence here the atps would not turn on so and that happens uh, I'm, i'm not showing the st structural details but that happens because when the target sequence is recognized the dna bends and the dna bending is what enga engages lets it engage with the motor domain so i believe if you i just provided a regular dna without the target sequence it would still bind with lower affinity but it wouldn't be able to engage with the motor domain and you don't uh, the uh, atps activity of the motor is very weak in the absence of uh, a target sequence containing dna so just having a dna is not enough to turn it on nor is absence of dna sufficient to turn on the atps you have to have a dna which has the target sequence so it is it is uh, a pathway which is running through this part as well as through this part that's fascinating thank you so uh, the question that uh, we now ask is what is the role of this atps motor and uh, to address that uh, as i mentioned this resembles a helicase motor and helicases are uh, enzymes which run along the dna double stranded dna and simultaneously unwind the dna but uh, there are uh, uh, homologs of helicases that don't unwind the dna but just run along uh, double strand dna and uh, examples of such motors include uh, what are atpss in the chromatin remodelers atp dependent chromatin remodelers which run along the double strand dna so the, here the motor uh, would uh, we knew beforehand that would is homologous to a translocase which runs along the double strand dna and to confirm that we carried out what we call a triplex displacement assay where we have a double strand dna with a target site for lab3 and we introduce a, a triplex forming oligo which can form a triplex with the dna and the oligo is labeled fluorescently labeled so uh, you add the enzyme provide atp and if the dna length of uh, 
uh, or the length of the DNA upstream of the target site is of, a, of appropriate length, the enzyme would start um, moving and you see the displacement of the triplex because the triplex here acts as a roadblock to the movement of the enzyme. And that would, uh, the enzyme being an active translocating motor would push this DNA off. And that you can visualize using uh, fluorescent spectroscopy. And you can see here is an example of the output that we get when we carry out such a reaction. And this is just an indicator to say that this number N is significant when it comes to activation of the ATPS motor and making it run along the DNA. So this experiment says that the enzyme binds to the target site. If you provide ATP, it will start running in that particular direction. Because if I take that triplex here, take this triplex and put it here, the enzyme will not displace it. It's a direct, it's an active process which has that particular direction. And the direction is along the arrowhead, which means that the enzyme will run along this way. And this process requires a lot of ATP. And we could measure that for every base pair that the enzyme moves forward, one ATP is consumed, which makes it a, a significantly uh, uh, energy consuming process. The other question that we had, uh, we had to uh, address at that time was uh, about what happens here. Is the enzyme running along the DNA or is it staying here in bound to the target site and pulling the DNA? Because in both the ways, the enzyme can uh, displace the DNA here, the triplex DNA. And the reason why we had this question in our mind was because the previous models had all shown that the enzymes would uh, loop the DNA, that is pull the targets, uh, pull the DNA while still being bound to the target site. And if that were happening, uh, our cleavage will not happen because we had we know that the cleavage happens somewhere in this region, while our nucleus was located upstream of the target site. And there is no way that a nucleus which is located upstream of the target site would cut DNA somewhere here while still being bound to the target sequence. So we hypothesize that the enzyme has to move along the DNA to cut the DNA. Now to show this, what we did was we took the help of a magnetic tweezers assay. And what we did was we took a piece of DNA, uh, had a magnetic bead uh, attached uh, and then uh, straightened it up uh, using a magnetic tweezers. Uh, this work was carried out in collaboration with Mark Shelkin at University of Bristol. Uh, and we, what we did was provide uh, enzyme with ATP and checked the position of the bead uh, if it had, if it loops the DNA, then the position of the D bead would come down because the DNA is being pulled down. Uh, but we did not notice that, which could mean that either the enzyme that we are providing is not active or it is actually running along the DNA. To show that the enzyme was active, what we did was we took a DNA which had rather than one target sequence, two target sequences uh, pointing head to head then provided the enzyme and ATP. And when we did that reaction, what we find is that the position of the bead remains the same over time in the presence of ATP. But after a while, the bead is lost from the field of view. So it's we imagine this to be like helium balloons strung to uh, threads and you cut the thread and the helium balloon would just float away. And which means you lose the sight of the bead and which meant the DNA was getting cut by the enzyme. And we showed that the enzyme does not loop the DNA, rather it runs along the DNA and carries out DNA cleavage. Now, uh, this, uh, based on this, uh, we proposed the following mechanism. If you have a type 1 SPRM enzyme shown here, one molecule, another molecule, and the DNA with the DNA substrate, you add the enzyme, it would bind to the target site. In the presence of ATP, they would converge, run along the DNA, converge, and cause cleavage. But uh, when we reach this stage of the mechanism, there is a uh, hiccup that we encounter. And the hiccup comes from our simple-minded model of bringing the two enzymes close to one another in a simple convergence model. 
And if you see where the nucleus domains are located, they are located 75 base pairs away, which means that a nucleus domain here would make a nick, which is a cut of a single strand and another cut here, which is separated by 75 base pairs. And you would know that the base pairing of 75 base pair is not going to destabilize this DNA just because there are two nicks on the double-stranded DNA. Consequently, we think something more is happening. To understand what is happening here, we first thought we should understand what is the kind of cleavage ends that are produced and uh, whether the nicks are separated actually by 75 base pairs or not. And to do that, we carried out a simple uh, molecular biology experiment where we use uh, enzymes T4 DNA polymerase and a ligase, and uh, sorry, a T4 DNA polymerase. And when then we use uh, 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 the broken ends treated with the polymerase and provide the nucleotides. If you have a three prime end, the broken end is chewed up. If it is overhung, it will get chewed up. If it is a blunt end, it remains as it is. And if it is a five prime overhang, it would get filled up by the DNA polymerase. And then uh, you provide a, a antibiotic acid ligate it with the ligase and take this uh, and transform them and then uh, take the plasmids and sequence them to see where the cleavages occurred, where the ends of the antibiotic cassettes are. And then we find that the positions of the mix uh, were far separated. So if you imagine this to be a double stranded DNA, this is one strand of the DNA and this is another strand of the DNA. And if the lines that you see linking the two uh, double strand, uh, two strands to be the position of the nicks on each of the strand, you can see that at short intervals of time, the cleavages are all clumped at around 30 base pairs of position, which means the separation between the nicks are primarily 30 base pairs. But over time, this number seems to increase. And sometimes we also noticed the nicks to be located beyond the target site of the DNA. The DNA in this particular, the target site in this particular DNA where this yellow lines, and we could see nicks happening beyond the target sites also. So based on this observation, uh, this experimental result, and based on what we had proposed earlier, we come up with this mechanism where you have the enzyme which makes nick. It does not stay there, but continuously moves and makes multiple nicks until two nicks come close to one another, forming a double strand DNA break. And that's the kind of uh, cleavage that these enzymes do, and which is nothing but not just one simple cut as a type two RNA enzyme would do, but a cut which results in multiple nicks. And when the two nicks come close, they would destabilize the double strand DNA resulting in a DNA break. And when you uh, observe this uh, on a gel, you see as a, a diffuse band, and we call this as DNA shredding. And uh, one of the best examples of a DNA shredder that we come across is the saw US one, which I introduced you at the beginning, which uh, if missing in Staphylococcus aureus can make it uh, susceptible to acquisition of antibiotic resistant genes, resistance genes. And uh, what SOUS1 does here is, if you provide the DNA with that substrate, uh, with the recognition site, so the recognition site of SOUS1 is uh, this and this, uh, you can see that it is unlike uh, type 1 SP enzyme in that it requires a methylated cytosine. Uh, so it actually functions as an enzyme that mo uh, cuts modified DNA rather than cutting unmodified DNA. So this is a result of the evolutionary arms race between bacteriophage and bacteria, each trying to outsmart the other. So you have enzymes that can cut now uh, uh, methylated DNA, and SOUS1 is one of them. Now, if you look at the cleavage pattern of SOUS1 on the gel, this is an agrose gel, or if I take a piece of DNA, full length DNA, which represents this DNA, it would come as a sharp band and when I treat it with saw US1 in, and ATP, you see that you get a pattern of this kind. Now, if you look at 
a similar uh, piece of DNA which has been treated with a type 2 restriction enzyme, in this case BSTN1, you get sharp bands resulting from cleavage at this position and at this position. And you get very sharp bands, which are characteristics of type 2 restriction enzymes. What we see with ATP dependent enzymes in general is shredding of the DNA, which in this case is exemplified by the fact that the band here, the central band here, has almost completely vanished, which is about 1,300 uh, 1, base pairs, which is this region. And this region has got shredded into pieces. And that's basically what makes SOU as one such a potent restriction enzyme, which would prevent uh, uh, the uh, host bacteria from acquiring foreign DNA. And uh, in the case of Staphylococcus, from gaining vancomycin resistance. And that's uh, one of the highlights of this restriction modification enzyme. We also think as a hypothesis and uh, something that we've been trying to uh, uh, prove is if the broken pieces are formed, as I said, the DNA pieces are shred and uh, you get uh, short fragments uh, based on uh, the study on type 1 SP, we know that we can get fragments which are about 30 nucleotides long single standard DNA. These fragments that are generated by the type 1 SP enzymes become a substrate for Cas1, Cas2 for acquisition towards CRISPR-Cas pathway. So basically what we see, what we propose is a possibility of a synergy between the innate or the restriction modification enzyme system and the adaptive immunity, which is a CRISPR-Cas system in bacteria. This uh, hypothesis, which uh, we're working towards trying to prove. So, Sai, again, uh, a slightly different question. Given that you have brought up the immunity angle, mm -hmm. suppose based on all the work, if I were to tinker the molecule, I mean, if I want to inhibit this entire system, mm -hmm. what is the best uh, domain to attack? The best domain to attack or the uh, region that often undergoes mutation is the target recognition domain. Which Correct, is, but that that is only giving you one angle in terms of uh, bringing about the modification. Right. But uh, your process so would also be about the, the modification because target recognition is required both for modification and nucleus. For cleavage. Yeah. Correct. So now, you can how much of on both of them? Okay, how much of processivity uh, is also a target for uh, you know? implementing any of this i mean is it not at all required because so, i'm just going by the energetic needs because i would imagine in a cell where there is competing uh, uh, you know strands of dna that are present okay. and if there is an infection uh, you will have a lot of energetic demand as well so i'm just wondering how much of processivity becomes a rate limiting factor here so if uh, by processivity you mean how long these enzymes can translocate Correct, right. Which is going to be dependent on your ATPase activity, right? Yes. And also of uh, the construct of the enzyme, because the enzyme has to remain bound to the DNA while it is moving along in such a, it, it is quite a fast process. It's about, these enzymes, for example, run at about 250 base pairs per second. Hmm. They can be, far, there are enzymes which are much faster, but they can be that fast and they need to be actually quite well bound at the same time sliding without uh, much hindrance along the DNA, without falling off. And we know that this can travel about 30,000 base pairs without falling okay. off. Okay. So would so processivity are... be a target for modif modifying the type 1 systems? Possible. Uh, that would depend but on multiple uh, points. Uh, so all these domains, in a sense, can interact with DNA. And each of these are contributing not only to the binding, but I think to the processivity also. Okay. So it is not as simple as making a few changes. Okay, sure. The simplest uh, way to change binding is by tweaking the target recognition or the methyl transferase domain. That would affect affinity for the recognition side. Yeah, but that will uh, severely impinge on your entire. Yes, absolutely. But according to what you are saying, where you are trying to reduce the uh, how long it goes forward. Right. 
uh, again, bringing up uh, on that, uh, we have now mutation which can slow down the enzyme. Okay. But I think they are still processing. Huh. So it's it's rate versus processivity. Both they are going to be different. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that uh, the mutant that I mentioned about earlier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So uh, as I mentioned, these enzymes are using uh, a nuclear ATP per base pair translocating as a translocated forward. Which means uh, if the separation between the target sites are like few thousand base pairs, these guys are going to chew up few thousand uh, ATPs. And like Ulans just mentioned, this can be uh, a strain on the cell, uh, which has its own benefits, which is something which we can discuss if time permits later about what could be the benefits of hydrolyzing so many nucleotides. But what I would like to uh, emphasize here are these enzymes are actually fuel, fuel guzzlers. They are using up a lot of ATP. Uh, in contrast, in nature, there exists the type 3 RM enzymes, which seem to do the same reaction, which are also nucleotide dependent, which also have the ATPase motor, but use very few uh, in comparison, very little ATP to carry out the cleavage reaction. And they also seem to have this double strand DNA with two target sequences separated by a few thousand base pairs and cleavage will happen, except that the cleavage happens close to one of the two target sites. Now, how, what makes this uh, enzyme uh, fuel efficient? And uh, in uh, literature, there have been uh, uh, two models that have been proposed. One was uh, you bring an enzyme here and an enzyme here close together by uh, Three D diffusion, and the other was one D diffusion. Now, uh, the way three D diffusion was shown was by uh, atomic force microscopy, and uh, they, people noticed uh, uh, loop formation, and uh, that model was proposed. But uh, then, in twenty thirteen, uh, a model was proposed. Uh, based on 1D diffusion. Before I come to 1D diffusion, I'll just introduce you to the enzyme. Uh, the type 3 enzyme is made up of a mod subunit, which is a methyl transverse, and a res subunit, which is a motor plus a, nu plus a nucleus. And uh, you, the entire enzyme complex is made up of two subunits of mod and a res subunit. And the res subunit has the motor and the nucleus domain. Now, uh, in 2013, an experiment was carried out where uh, a single piece of DNA uh, with a magnetic bead uh, attached to one end was uh, used for a magnetic tweezer assay, which also was coupled to turf microscopy. And uh, what was done was the DNA, which has a target site, and uh, you provide the enzyme, which is uh, labeled, and also ATP. And what, what I show below here is a chymograph. Uh, over here is the piece of DNA. So this is the bead, and you can see the line for the bead. And this is the target site where the enzymes will bind to begin with. And once the enzymes bind, uh, over time, in the presence of ATP, you can see this enzyme's position changing. And they are going long distances, but are also coming back and going in the opposite direction. Based on this study, it was proposed that these enzymes are doing 1D diffusion. And uh, we uh, wanted to understand the role of the ATP. So what we did was basically we took uh, the motor and the nucleus domain of the enzyme complex and selectively mutated them, either the nucleus and the or the motor, and tried to understand what was the role of ATP uh, in uh, uh, DNA cleavage. And we could do that because uh, we had an enzyme system where there were two very closely related enzymes, uh, ECOP1 and ECOP59, which are almost identical, but they recognize two different target sites and they can cooperate with each other. So if I take a DNA with the target site of ECOP1 and ECOP59, and I mix them, uh, use uh, the two enzymes together, I can still get the DNA to be cleaved. But if I use only one of these enzymes, the DNA does not get cleaved because there is only one target, in, target site for one of the enzymes. 
So for cleavage to happen with target sites of ECOP1 and ECOP15, I pointing in head to head orientation, I have to add the two enzymes. And then what I can do is selectively mutate the ATPase domain of this enzyme while keeping this active cleave uh, or mutate the nucleus domain this, of this enzyme while keeping this active, vice versa, and have different combinations. And only certain combinations resulted in DNA cleavage. So this is again uh, agarose gel, which is showing a DNA cleavage assay where you have a double strand DNA with the target site of one target site of ECOP15 and one site of uh, ECOP1 pointing head to head. And you see if you I provide the two Y type enzymes uh, or one Y type enzymes, I can see cleavage. Uh, I will uh, I will just show you this. There is something happening here that cleavage happens but I'm not going into the details of it, but that's an observation that we led us to say that a single site can also cleave the DNA. And then if you mix with two different enzyme combinations, only certain combinations resulted in cleavage. And we know that you require both the ATPase of both these enzymes to be active, as well as the nucleus for the, of the two enzymes to be active for double strand break to happen. However, you can have the nucleus domain of one of these enzymes inactive, but both of the ATPs should be active, and you would get to see a double strand DNA NIC, which is basically a NIC in the target, uh, a NIC on the double stranded DNA, which results in only one strand getting cut. And based on this uh, analysis, we propose the following mechanism. So this is in combination with the 1D diffusion method. Uh, uh, mechanism proposed uh, by Schwartz et al. And in the context of the uh, mutational studies that we did, we now know that the type 3 RM enzymes would bind to the target sequence, use ATP to become proficient in carrying 1D diffusion. What is interesting is that this motor domain is the same as the motor domain of type 1 SPRM enzyme, but one does an active translocation and the other does a passive. 1D diffusion. So once again, if I show you, here is the enzyme which does the motor uh, diffusion. And if you have another enzyme bound to the target site with ATPase activated, they would come together physically and cause double strand DNA cleavage. And both of them have to come together physically for cleavage to happen. You cannot have one enzyme sitting and doing a nick you have to have both the enzymes physically interacting for the cleavage to happen. So it's very tightly regulated. That's the amazing thing of this enzyme. And what you see is a cleavage happening close to one of the target site. And that's because one of the enzymes which has hydrolyzed ATP should remain bound to the target site for the cleavage to happen. If uh, both of them are freely diffusing, cleavage is not happening which is why you don't see cleavage in any other part of the DNA. And that's, I think, a fantastic uh, regulation for which we do not have the structural basis. I, I should apologize. It would have been fantastic to understand structurally what is happening to make this uh, a unique feature, but um, something that we are working towards right now. But, and I hope I can uh, share it with you whenever we are successful. But, this is what the enzyme does. So here is an enzyme which- Sai, what, is the, what yeah. is the time scale for such cleavage in these kinds of systems? Yes, so the, that's, a, that's the question that comes to mind. A 1D diffusion, how quick can it be? So if you look at the reaction kinetics, it is comparable to the reaction a cleavage of uh, done by type 1 SP RM enzyme. And this is made possible by the diffusion coefficient of the enzyme being very high. So it can actually move along a long distance. And that is what makes it uh, so quick. Okay. So it's not short diffusion, but it's a sure. long range diffusion. Sure, sure. And that is actually made possible. So uh, the authors, Schwarz et al, they actually measured the diffusion coefficient of this uh, enzyme. Right. Right. And then they showed that it has a very high diffusion coefficient. Right. And so that's the way they do. So it's a fantastic piece of machine that nature has created where one, you have an active motor and another, which is just diffusing along the DNA to do the same reaction. So that's uh, now um, 
Sai, okay. I have a quick question. Yes. So, uh, so 1D diffusion is all good, but it cannot give you directionality, can it? Yes. So the only way uh, this uh, enzyme can work, so if I show you the, my picture here, uh, the enzyme is uh, able to do bo move both the directions. So there is no direction in a sense. But the enzyme, because of its diffusion coefficient, can execute long range diffusion. Once in one direction, it proceeds for a very long distance. And that is what facilitates this interaction. But if it's diffusion, I presume that it has some step lengths and sometimes it will go left, sometimes it will go right. Yes. And going long distance in one direction, you know, can happen in things known as Brownian ratchets and all, but usually you take energy. So um, there, is a, there is a paper, uh, this has contribution from Biman Bakshi also. This is from Sunnizi's lab in Howard. Well, uh, I think this paper is uh, first author is Duman Bakshi. I think in a sabbatical possibly he had been there, which talks about how enzymes can execute long directional diffusion dependent on the diffusion coefficient of the molecule. If the diffusion coefficient is large, they can execute long distances. Right, but it is equally possible to go the other way. So yes, half so, of the thing to so, be uh, you a very practice. interesting point. Yes, uh, which is that these guys don't have to always point head to head. You can have the orientation in inverted orientation. The same target sequences could be inverted and you can see cleavage to happen because it is possible that this enzyme moves here and this target site gets occupied by something, sorry, this, this target site would get occupied by another enzyme and it would cleave. If this arrow was pointing 180 degrees opposite. So that is possible. We see that happening. If you have inverted uh, uh, target site, you see still cleavage. But of course, the efficiency is low because the enzyme has a tendency to fall off. So most of the enzymes would not come back. They would possibly fall off. But here, by the time they get here, there is an enzyme bound here. And that is what uh, results in the cleavage. Uh, if you are happy, I can spend 10 minutes on something different or we can stop here. Or we can stop here. Maybe Jyotishwan can speak for some time or something. I don't know. I can uh, stop here and then we can. Yeah. Have uh, I don't know. Jyotishwan may have stepped out or something. I uh, I think five o'clock. It's yeah. Probably yeah, it if you're going to move to something else. Uh, no, it's yeah. It will be a change of here. So maybe we can stop here. Yeah. yeah. Though I am not the host Jyotishwan yet, but I don't know where it's. So, uh, uh, what I would uh, end with is my acknowledgement. And uh, this is a work that uh, has been driven primarily by my PhD and master students at ISA Pune. And uh, different, there are different uh, restriction enzymes that we study, and uh, students who have contributed are listed here. Uh, primarily, Mahesh Chand, who carried out the type 1 SP restriction modification enzyme system. Mansi Kulkarni, Ishtiak Ahmed, who did the type three project, who have been working on, who worked on the project and then now are doing the postdoctoral work. MCRBC system by Neha, about which I'm not talking. And so US one is something done by Vinayak Sadashivam in the laboratory. And uh, we cannot uh, do much of these studies without facilities. And there is the cryo EM access facility about which I didn't talk about. But single molecules, which was carried out in collaboration with Mark Shelkin and then the synchrotron facilities where we uh, carry out crystallographic studies with the crystals that we grow and uh, serve for the funding without which much of this work would not have been possible. And I support for the support. Thank you very much. Thanks Hi. again.
discussion. Yep. Yeah, Sai. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Um, sorry, I had to step out, Sai. Oh, good. Uh, you sure. concluded immediately. Um, um, yeah, but so, I thought uh, it was the right time for either stopping or uh, going forward. So I thought I would. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think this was all on the. Uh, in time, I think you could have gone on for it five more minutes. That's that's all fine. Yeah, so, but, but but thank you. For, those are very nice stories. So I think uh, uh, thank you for sharing some of this excitement. And I would like to apologize that I I actually mis mispronounced your last name uh, instead of saying Kayarat, I said Karayat. So sorry about that. Oh. The initial. Uh, so we want to formally apologize. So, um, Sai, um, there will be more questions. So, let, let me actually open the floor for uh, questions from the audience. So, questions? Okay. Um, so, can I just, just for the record, I think as you said that uh, these time scales are pretty you know, engaging to sort of understand and think about, and especially with these diffusing uh, systems. So how do you, how does one propose to look at the molecular level changes? You would like to, again, take snapshots, like X-ray snapshots of, that would be so, the goal? Yes, that would be the goal. Uh, so something simple in mind is how will you make a molecule uh, diff, uh, proficient for long range diffusion? Right. Uh, one simple, idea that uh, exists in my mind and many others is about a molecule that would act like something that would facilitate sliding along the DNA. So we want an enzyme that can form a ring-like structure along the DNA so that it does not fall off. So it, it's, it's like uh, those uh, handles that you have in buses and uh, uh, suburban trains of uh, Mumbai <laughs> where it can move along the road with minimum friction, but still does not come out of the rod. That's the kind of uh, structural snapshot that I imagine we might get of a system, especially post ATP hydrolysis, where you would see a conformational change that would uh, make a nice uh, uh, embrace the DNA without actually making a tight interaction, which would actually be a friction then and prevent it from moving forward. So that's the impression. So so, so one of the things I think that I have always had a question with regards to bioenergetics in general, and um, you know, is what does how does the ATP hydrolysis really couple in to do whatever post you know energy transduction to other sorry conformational changes? How does the hydrolysis chemistry translate into conformational change? What is the fundamental? When I, Maybe crystallography may not be able to tell us that in terms of how the chemical energy from a bond breaking step really is captured in the conformational part. It's something I think it's one of the fundamental questions and I guess uh, maybe a couple of crystal structures in snapshots would enable some aspects of it. But do you have a sense of whether this is an important, I, I, think, I think it's one of the most important questions, but what do you think about uh, this particular, uh, you know, so, uh, the way uh, we understand how uh, 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 nucleotide hydrolysis of a nucleotide res results in chemical energy, which can then be yes. passed into uh, yes. mechanical movement, right, right, protein conformational changes, right. something uh, uh, where you have the nucleotide, which is a triphosphate. One example is this: you have a triphosphate, which where the nucleotide binds to the enzyme, right. and because of the binding and the interactions made by the enzyme with the nucleotide, the enzyme or the motor undergoes a conformational change. Yes, and this conformational change is then held there, and as long as it is ATP or a trinucleotide triphosphate, uh, it is going to remain as it is in the same conformation. But the moment you break cut, the cut. bond between the beta and the gamma phosphate, yes, phosphate, that releases energy 
Yes. But it is also that's the classical view. It's that it releases energy. But the question is, where does the energy go? Yes. How so does it get? Is, what happens is this is now uh, filled by structural studies where we have uh, structures of uh, substrate bound. In this case, the substrate we are assuming is ATP and or uh, nucleotide, trinucleotide, phosphate, and uh, ADP, okay. the product form. Okay. So now you compare the product form and the substrate form. Right. Look at the change in the structure and the interactions. Sure. Sure. What we see is that there is a large conformational change. And often the product form has a conformation similar to the uh, nucleotide sure. free form. Sure. Mm -hmm. So the nucleotide, when the ATP binds, it takes a closed conformation. Sure. Uh, this is something we use in the field. And when the nucleotide is hydrolyzed, it goes back to its original. So it's like a spring that is right. released. Right. And, uh, uh, if you do it only for one cycle, it becomes a switch. But if you do this continuously, where your ADP that is formed is right. immediately replaced by a fresh molecule of ATP, right? then again, the conformation closes on, closes, and then you have hydrolysis converting it to ADP, and the structure becomes open. This cycle continues, and then you have a motor. And if this conformational change, continuous conformational change, is coupled to an activity, say binding to DNA, the enzyme, the motor can actually, uh, if required, if designed, can move forward sure. in one direction. Okay. okay. That's uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the motors which hydrolyze nucleotides work. Sure. So uh, there are two classes: the switches, which just undergo one conformation change. It's a one cycle, and then that results in some activity or uh, activity or function. The other is this continuous hydrolysis, which is what motors do. So uh, that is something interesting here because uh, I said in the case, I've been generally using the word motor and it is actually particularly true only for the type one and the soluous one system I showed today. But uh, the type three system, it looks is not a motor, but rather a switch where a conformational change caused by one event of nucleotide hydrolysis makes it proficient for the diffusion. And you don't require ATP hydrolysis anymore sure. in theory. You can have the enzyme carrying out okay. the diffusion. Okay. okay. There it becomes a switch. Sure. Okay, fine. Ankona, Ankona has a question? Yeah, Ankona. Yeah, uh, nice talk, Sai. So uh -huh. uh, I just wanted to ask, when we are talking, when you just mentioned about the time scales and looking at the different you know, events that are happening before and after the event, how do you plan to, you know, like uh, isolate and crystallize each of these states? Wouldn't it be like, or do you have plans of doing some kind of imaging studies as well, where you could actually use labeled substrates or, you know, chemical probes that could give you um, information about the time scale in living uh, systems? So I think that is absolutely required, what you have mentioned. We, I don't think structural data can fill in all the gaps. The structural data possibly gives us the snapshots and uh, we can morph between these snapshots in an imaginary way to understand how things might work. But to fill the real data in, we require uh, dynamic studies and uh, uh, possibly I was we are at Jyotishman and I were talking about uh, some of the studies that he does and uh, looking at uh, ligands binding to enzymes and uh, whether one can sense through fluorescence change by he has a system where he has a tryptophan with two phenylalanine stacking yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and can such devices be used for our studies is something that would actually fill in a lot of information absolutely true uh, uh, being a molecule we will have to be uh, using this uh, techniques more than uh, because of the resolution limit. So I think the fluoros uh, studies uh, uh, like stop flow using such uh, ligands or sensors would actually be really helpful. I think that's something which I think we have always been looking at to see if there would be someone who would be interested in looking at our enzymes too. So for example, the tweezers assay is something we couldn't have addressed because this was an 
question that hit our face the moment we saw the structure and we couldn't have addressed it until we had the magnetic pieces so yeah. i think we really require uh, uh, complementary studies and uh, techniques to fill in the gaps otherwise it's very i think it is just snapshots in the end. Uh, to fill in the gaps is important but yes uh, the snapshots provide the guidance to go forward thank you thank you thank you ampuna thank you for the question any other questions well if there are none uh, let us thank again uh, sai for a wonderful talk a uh, lot of very detailed structural information and mechanistic information um sai and, and uh, um many apologies that we could not host you for a tea here this is a tradition uh, we take the speaker for the tea and all the audience members who are um sitting to the end of the colloquium they join and uh, you know there's a conversation but thank you very much for doing this thanks for doing and, thanks and, very much for and, and, and shudip to is saying bye bye, bye. 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 Yeah. um bye. so uh, i would like to also thank the lecture theater um uh, lecture theater mistri ji who is operating lecture theater for this uh, colloquium thank you mistri ji and um and i would like to announce to people who are remaining on the few of us who are remaining that next week we have um we have a colloquium by professor shankar ghosh um, and he'll be talking about soft matter so um uh, with that i would conclude this session and stop the live